welcome everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show and today things are looking a little different because it's a fry yay as Jarrett ransom boy says <laughs> with, with the hands thank you julia with the hands. you know i can't say one without the other it's kind of goes hand in hand um but we're still at the fabulous cultivate event with our friends at national universities fundraising academy in southern california we're talking san diego and um, we're really, really excited that they allowed us to stay on their campus for a second day. Jared Ransom, good job, girl. You didn't get kicked off. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> the day is young. But um, no, it's really fun. Jared, before we got started, took uh, her computer and ran through the halls of the university really quickly. So <laughs> I could see kind of some, some of their um, classrooms and facilities. Julia, that's called asynchronous learning, and that's what we just experienced in real that's, time. Yes. In real life, right? there you go. Perfect example. Perfect example. Well, you know, today we're going to go forward with our ask and answer, but we're going to do something a little differently, and that is we're going to ask and answer the two of the the brain trusts that we have with Fundraising Academy, and we're going to really talk about their journey and what they've experienced. Um, along their successful career. So you won't want to miss this because it's it's just an opportunity for us that we just we rarely have in this in this type of uh, work that we do. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm with Jarrett Ransom, who's actually in San Diego and has been for this conference where she presented. Um, and so we're delighted that she would show up and represent um, the nonprofit show. The Nonprofit Show, we're now in our fourth year. We've done more than 800 episodes, and this is due to the fact that we have amazing support. And that support comes from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, of course, fundraising at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, it's really important, and Jared, I like to remind our viewers and our listeners and ourselves that our sponsors put no editorial uh, or content management guidelines upon us. So we can talk to whomever we want. We talk to their competitors. We, we do things as we see fit that, that serves our community. And that's pretty bold because a lot of sponsorships don't work like that. And so I always think it's important to, to bring that forward. Hey, if you have missed anything, uh, any of our broadcasts, or you want to join in, you can find us on our streaming platforms, our podcasts, and now our new sexy app that um, Kevin Pace and his team developed for us. It's really a cool tool. You can scan this barcode, and then you'll get a push notification each and every time a new show is uploaded. And you can also search the archives. It's a really wonderful tool. Okay, I have done my housekeeping as we get to as we like to say um jared i've got to ask you a quick question before we go too much further um talk to us about what you saw at cultivate and and what went on before you introduce our guests in person and, and move on with your questions yeah, thanks, Julia, and thanks to everyone who's uh, joining us for today's conversation. So the conference is, was fantastic. I feel like we're still like basking in the energy mm -hmm. of it. Um, high vibration, I would say, you know, yesterday the atrium was filled with so much energy, so many people hugging, high-fiving, just so glad to be back IRL in real life. Um, and we had phenomenal panel of speakers, a uh, really great keynote speaker. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we were part of them. Um, but there was just so much going on, a lot of learning, a lot of curiosity, right? And uh, so really good. So we are still here on campus at National University here in San Diego. And of course, I have LaShonda and Muhi joining us uh, today for the Ask and Answer. We also had breakfast together. We shared a lift together. So, you know, we I really, walked. yeah, <laughs> he wanted to, he was offered, but yeah, that's, that's, you know, Muhi's been traveling the world and, and in other parts of the world besides America, they walk. <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> I know it's mind blowing. So. Um, so yes, yeah, really exciting. Um, over 150 people, I think, were yes, here yesterday. Yeah. 
We're already talking about next year's conference and a potential for a two day. Don't know if that will happen, but that was one of the suggestions. Well, you know, it's, there's so much information and I really give credit to Fundraising Academy for, for putting this in a, um, an ecosystem of two tracks, one for fundraisers and then one for maybe more executive leadership, board talent, things of that nature. Um, you've got two outstanding fundraisers uh, with you today. So I'm going to really let you go into to some of those questions that we really want to know. I think a lot of times we're afraid to ask them, but to get their, their sense of, of how their journey has played out. Yeah, absolutely. So in the spirit of embracing AI and new <laughs> technology, right, I did have chat GPT come up and form five questions that uh, you might want to ask a professional fundraiser. And so Muhi is here uh, joining me as well as LaShonda. And so they know the questions. As Muhi said, actually, I'm going to let you say it, knowing that I had these formed by ChatGPT, you said, I wish I had ChatGPT write my answers. <laughs> Right. So, um, but this will be fun. So I do have these five questions. Yeah. Would love to just kind of go back and forth, you know, um, in, in a in a free spirit. So we'll start off with what motivated you to pursue a career in the nonprofit sector mm -hmm. and become a professional fundraiser? Oh gosh. So I will say that the reason why I decided to enter the philanthropic space as a professional is a result of teachers. My, my teachers in high school were very instrumental in ensuring that I secured scholarship funding to go on to college. I am a first-generation college student on my mother's side. And so having that funding available has always been very important and it provided a, a steady foundation and it provided a sense of security and in that vein, I've always wanted to work in a space where I would be able to pay it forward um, and do the types of things that my teachers in high school did for me. Mm -hmm. And so it just came very natural. And, and my first job was actually a teacher. And when I got hired at my old high school, initially they um, had me be the cheerleader sponsor. So I had to do fundraising for out uniforms. Then I became a senior class sponsor. So then I was fundraising for the class. And then before you know it, I was acclimated with my national alumni association and on the board and boom, full-time okay. fundraiser. And it's been history ever since. I saw the cheerleading side of her come out yesterday. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was fun. A little secret. I was yes. a cheerleader as well. Yes. So it was it was in good company. Thank you, Lashonda and Muhi. What what ignited your passion? Yeah, you know, for me, it was really a uh, internship that I had in my last semester of undergrad. Uh, for the first three and a half years of my undergrad, I was a mechanical engineering major. Very surprising, I know. Wow, um, did you know that? He told me yesterday, he was, <laughs> was it Tuesday when we were yeah. putting things together? And I was like, I can tell because he has, <laughs> he has some really great skills, you all. Um, so it was just like a internship that fell in my lap um, and really guided me through the university of, it was called a development summer internship program at the University of Michigan. And you got to see how the university fundraised from their alumni, the hospital system, the sports team, engagement, stewardship, uh, and seeing a university development staff of 500 oh, working wow. on fundraising for the university, raising billions yeah. of dollars. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, grassroots, can you please buy this plate of barbecue? <laughs> so um, my first role was in the alumni relations office and been at it since 2009. So that's wow. been a long journey. Yeah. I love hearing that. I actually have commonalities with both. Mine started as an intern as well for a chamber of commerce. So nice. I love hearing the origin stories of the career, right? Like what really ignited us into, into the sector? Because I also say like, I went through school when nonprofit management was not a degree. Right. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I love that it is now. And then mm -hmm. there's so many great opportunities. Okay. The next question that chat GPT formed for me <laughs> Could you describe some of the key milestones or turning points in your professional journey as a fundraiser? I'll let you take this one. Sure. Um, you know, I think young in my career, um, being let go from a job was a pivotal moment. Um, and I'll claim it as a milestone because it really changed my perspective on mm -hmm. how I need to show up professionally. Right. Right. Um, and, you know, I think it went to the entire opposite spectrum of becoming a workaholic 
Um, so, you know, I feel that too. Yeah. Yes. I can swing on both sides of the pendulum there. Um, but I think for me, you know, just different career points has been like working for five years at the American Red Cross, raising hundreds of millions of dollars for people in need after disasters. And uh, that's been really inspiring for, for me, seeing how a large billion dollar organization operates. Yeah. Um, and then also bringing some skills uh, back to the American Muslim philanthropic landscape and nonprofits that um, are serving so many people, even outside of our community and faith. Um, but just trying to be a fundraising philanthropic development professional extraordinaire yeah. uh, through it all. Yeah. I appreciate the realness, right, of being let go from a position, let go from an organization, a company. Um, so, so thank you. You know, I've I've been there too, and I would say that is definitely a milestone moment. You, it, it's how you bounce back, right. right, from that. So, what about you, Lashonda? Gosh, Muhi, excellent. You know, I'm, I'm getting really talked up about that. Um, there were a couple of pivotal points, and I would say because of my background and everything has really kind of happened or um, organically throughout my career. My career path literally is aligned with everything that I've experienced in my in my secondary education. So with that, I will say that, you know, after leaving my high school um, as a teacher, I had an opportunity to work with Project Grad Atlanta, which is a nonprofit organization that raises money specifically yes. for scholarships that includes multiple parts of that, which includes some academic areas. But that philanthropics piece was uh, very important to me because I had a chance to work very closely with the executive director at the time and to see how he was able to forge relationships with um, Spelman College, with Morehouse College, as well as the business community in the greater Atlanta metropolitan area to secure okay. funding for those said scholarships for the students in the area. And then I would say a second milestone for me was when I transitioned back into the Houston area and I joined my alumni association. I was on the executive board. I was membership committee. I was doing lots of volunteer work yeah. and I had an opportunity to return to my alma mater and working in, um, in the development division, which was a phenomenal opportunity because it was things that I was doing already as yeah. a volunteer mm -hmm. and I was able to apply it on a larger scale and be able to impact even more students. And again, with my initial intent is to help students you know, secure economic empowerment through education and what better way is through your organ, your alma mater. Yes. So, you know, during that time I've been able, I was able to do quite a few things and create some, some, um, some new levels of expectation when it comes to the philanthropic space. And then I pivoted again, roughly four months ago, and now I'm at South Texas College of Law, which I'm definitely loving. And again, going back to high school, initially I wanted to be an attorney. Is it not amazing how everything comes <laughs> full circle. That's so right. um, being able to help students go on to law school, we know law school is very expensive mm -hmm. and to help minimize some of that debt has been yeah, very fulfilling in itself. So throughout my career, everything has been meaningful and it all goes back to those early childhood formative years. Wow. That just touches me like so wholeheartedly. Uh, there's, yeah. there's so much uh, resonation with that as well. So Great, great question. So good, good job, chat GPT. <laughs> okay. Um, this is, this is another one that I really appreciate, but it's what are the most significant challenges you have faced in your career as a professional fundraiser and how did you overcome them? Ooh. They're so, <laughs> I err on the side of positivity. So yes, I, yes, she does. I err on the side of positivity. So I will say that probably the greatest challenge that I experienced was probably working with my alma mater. And I told everyone um, all the time that it was an honor and a privilege, mm -hmm. but also it can be a great challenge. And it can be a great challenge because you know many of those prospects on a personal level sure. and the organization owns those relationships. And so when making the ask for leadership level gifts, and then also with annual fund, you know, you expect individuals within your, your circle yeah. to to respond um, in a certain way because you, you have privy to qualify them right. from a physical perspective because you've been into their homes because you know, you know, the lifestyle that they have. And so with that, I had to really shift my mindset. And rather than having that personal relationship at the forefront, making sure that I maintained my professionalism with them as individuals and be very cognitive to treat them as a donor that I'm trying to transition through the donor cycle and transitioning them from that 
annual gift yeah. into those leadership in those major gifts that I knew they had capacity to, to, to support. And that's a fine line. It is a right? very like, fine line. Learning um, to navigate that is is always interesting. Yeah. But I'm sure you did it with grace. Yeah, I, I did, you know, and then, you know, there were a couple of moments when I did make phone calls and I was like, hey, thank you so much for that wonderful gift. We're looking forward to that additional gift in the immediate future, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. That. And so, yeah, I, you know, I was the queen of follow-ups because, you know, stewardship is a major part of that. And just, you know, setting the expectations and again, making sure that I maintain that level of professionalism and not crossing the line too much with yeah. those personal relationships. Yeah. Not to be, Hey girl, can we get some money? <laughs> yeah. I'm like I saw your check and it just was not what we discussed. <laughs> now you can do better. <laughs> I love this. Well, Mugi, same question. So what is uh, the most significant challenges that you faced in your career? And then also, how did you overcome them? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my first two jobs out of um, college were being a one person development team, right? So I think in those organizations, sometimes it was challenging to just having to do everything right? Mm -hmm. uh, from event planning to grant writing, to entering things into the CRM, to mm -hmm. cultivating relationships and meeting a $1 million fundraising goal, yeah. right? Do you feel it on your shoulders? Oh, like man. all of what you're saying is just- Yeah. <laughs> and, and here's what it is. I didn't realize it at the time, right? right? It's now that I've slowed down my life, been able to just mm -hmm. really work part-time and enjoy- life more than work where before again that whole path of being a workaholic you don't realize it it's the yeah. norm for you uh you're maybe in a work environment that isn't as pleasant where you're just getting more dumped on you and you don't say no <laughs> yeah. right so or you just feel like this um you know belief in the mission that drives you yeah right but at your own expense mm -hmm. Um, so that, that was challenging was navigating that and not being able to stick up for myself because I didn't know how to, yeah. um, so how to advocate, right. Exactly. For that. I, I appreciate that. And I hope again, that all of our viewers and listeners, you know, hear this because I'm, I'm curious, and this was not on the chat GPT questions, but how long have you been in your careers? Gosh, Ooh, almost two decades. Okay. I mean, I'm not that old, uh, <laughs> but uh, he means that he doesn't have as many years of experience. 14, 14. 14 yeah, so. you're close. Yeah. You're close. And, and I'm right along there with you in that age. So watch it, buddy. I'm careful. Yeah, I'll, I'll be careful. careful. Yeah. But I, I asked that because it really shows to like um, the maturity to advocate for and yourself. the immaturity. <laughs> and you and no, and, yeah. but you're right because you know, and, and as professional fundraisers, we're always advocating for our causes. Yes. Right. And you know, right. like Muhi, I share that same challenge, and that is at being an advocate for myself. Yourself. You know, I you know someone else. You know, I'm all day, every day. I can. Same. Fake the case. Um, but then when it comes to myself, you I got do. the bagel for Jared. You advocated for her as breakfast. This you know, morning. I you know, and that and is I just you have it. And you did, and that's just Only who wants you didn't want to cause problems, exactly. Jared. Jared you exactly owned it. Out. You should have owned it because I was like, no, that's not right. There was a mishap at breakfast <laughs> where Jared also wanted an everything bagel, but they gave one everything bagel and one plain bagel. So Jared just took the plain bagel and there was LaShonda, our savior in the moment, our shining knight in armor Yeah, came through. And she advocated. And, and she, advocated for she then everything. ate the everything bagel. So he went straight to the punt. So the part in the middle, as soon as I found out she didn't get her everything bagel, I was like, well, wait a minute. Where is your bagel? You asked for it. I was like, well, so did we not pay for it? And he was like, yeah, I paid for it. And I was like, but you wanted it. And she's like, no, I just don't want to cause any trouble. And I was like, well, you <laughs> So I go up to the counter and I'm like, hey there, we're going to be claiming the donation of the everything bagel, if you don't mind. <laughs> yep. So the fundraiser in her, the advocate in her. <laughs> exactly. The belief is so deep, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, so. it's, you know, it's it's interwoven within my, yeah. my, my ecosystem, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. yeah. But I love the, you know, to advocate for your cause, advocate for yourself, yourself. Advocate, advocate for your bagel. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag advocate for your bagel. Yeah. Hashtag it's everything. <laughs> <laughs> Except for when it's plain. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, I'm going to move us along. Um, and I think we have time for one more. So this one is, how do you stay up to date mm. with the latest trends and the best practices in fundraising? Mm. And how have these infl- insights influenced your approach to fundraising over the years? So we're talking a couple of decades, not yeah. quite a couple of decades, but you're pretty darn close. <laughs> so how do you stay up to date with the trends and the best practices? And I mean, we were talking about, you know, you're a CFRE mm-hmm. and then you got trained in cause selling education, yes. which is a little bit of a different model. So I'm going to let you start. So I read, I literally, I read a lot and I try to set time in each day around lunchtime where I'm looking, I'm Googling, I'm searching to find out what's happening on current trends. Obviously watching your podcast helped me keep up to date because there's some really great questions being answered. Um, and reading has been everything for me. You know, I'm always on the AFP website. I'm always yeah. looking to see what's going on in the business world because you never know what type of donor that you'll encounter. And you want to have the most current information about how to adapt to those particular demographic groups, um, Gen Z, you know, high wealth donors, you just never know. And then also being abreast of what's happening um, in the economy holistically, because depending on the timing, when you're preparing for various types of campaigns, it may impact um, your, your projections right. and do, you need to be able able to pivot and to be able to do that, you want to stay knowledgeable. So reading for me has been uh, the greatest source of information in helping me stay acclimated. I'm always seeking professional development opportunities. I'm at conferences, cultivate. (laughs) So um, I go to AFP Icon. I'm a local yeah. member of my AFP chapter. Uh, so I really try to stay in tune. And then there's Case because I work for a higher, ed- higher education institution. Sure. So those are just a couple of areas where I'm just always involved. Gosh. Do you sleep? I am trying to get a little sleep this afternoon. <laughs> Good. That's so a, yeah, that's since it's gray, I can, I can get a little sleep. That's right. But yeah, but I stay busy. I, I don't let grass grow under my feet because there's lots of work to do and mm-hmm. lots of advocacy. And yeah. law school is not cheap. Not so, so yeah. yeah, the law students, they're looking for some funds. <laughs> <laughs> Muhi, what about you? Same question. Yeah, you know, in addition to everything that uh, LaShonda mentioned, I would say that Chronicle of Philanthropy yes. is a great resource. Um, and also Giving USA, you know, it's coming yes. out this week. So yes. um, Love. just being able to see what the trends are. Um, there's also... Um, you know, even the sessions that we had at Cultivate were very helpful looking at data uh, Mm -hmm. and giving and how we can implement best strategies. Um, So just, you know, being a lifelong learner is is the key. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, what do you think? uh, We love this question, Julia, but it's the crystal ball question, right? So, so pull out your crystal balls. It might be in your back pocket or, or somewhere. I know shine them up. (laughs) What are you seeing for the future of philanthropy in today's economy? Like, what are you seeing and forecasting as we move forward with all of this knowledge, all of the excitement here that we've just experienced at Cultivate? What are you forecasting as we move forward? I would say that we're dealing with more sophisticated donors now more than ever, and that we'll definitely have to be um, in tune with Gen Z. Yeah. And you, because many of the traditional things that we were taught in the philanthropic space are no longer applicable as is. We have okay. to be able to apply and modify in accordance to that demographic and meet them where they are to ensure that we're able to um, provide the information that they'd like in the manner that they would like mm-hmm. and communicate with them most effectively based on their particular yeah. demographic group. Because um, otherwise there'll be a huge disconnect and just making sure that we are keen to understand the economy at in real time Mm -hmm. because you know with house mortgage rates and potential you know shutdowns of the government people tend to make uh they tend to be less benevolent because they want to make sure that they have those extra funds in their accounts and so just being very mindful of what's happening in the economy holistically yeah great great response what about your crystal ball muhi yeah you know i think with the intergenerational transfer of wealth that's going to happen in the next you know two decades um there's a big opportunity to yes learn the habits of millennials and others uh that you know, majority of their wealth may be in cryptocurrency and are equipped and handled to receive those types of assets in the future. Um, So preparing for now, um, working on estate planning will be essential uh, and offering those opportunities and making sure that nonprofit organizations, if they're a small staff, can still be equipped to handle gifts of those types. Absolutely. Definitely. 
Great, great responses. Really great. And, you know, I love that we had this opportunity because, you know, we have uh, really enjoyed our time with LaShonda Williams and Muhi Kawaja on our, on the nonprofit show, but we have very, we always have a wide assortment of questions that come and then we don't really get to hear about them and their journey as professionals. So this was really valuable and I learned a lot. And I know a lot of our viewers and listeners will uh, benefit from this conversation as well. Um, So thank you both for coming on and sharing your time. I know you worked really hard this week to navigate, you know, Cultivate's first, uh, you know, I I should say debut conference. Um, And so to come back and and do this with us on Friday has really been a delight. And again, I've learned a lot and I, I, I will say that when I hear you speak and I I hear how intelligent you are and committed, it gives me hope for the philanthropic landscape. I mean, wouldn't you say that, Jared? It's it's like Absolutely. it's inspiring. It's inspiring and, and I love because I think you both, you know, really touched on this is the way donors are giving is changing. And so the previous question is how are you staying on top of current yeah. trends? Yeah. How are you moving forward? Like the way that maybe we were raised to do it and, and the, you know, um, the staff at that time trained us to do it. I, I, I think I'm in good company here of of disruption, right. Where it's like, okay, we're not doing it that way. That's not the way that's working anymore. Exactly. And we need to be innovative Mm -hmm. and we need to go with the current trends and also hear what our donors are saying. Exactly. We have to adhere to what they're saying and what they want. Otherwise our campaigns will not be successful. Yeah. We have to be able to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. I've really enjoyed this. I've enjoyed being here, you know, at the conference at Cultivate. I'm looking forward to next year's conference already. And uh, also spending some quality, friendly time with my colleagues. It's been wonderful. It's just been a, a treat. And I, I, again, Muhi and Lashonda, thank you for taking this time. And, and thank you. Anytime. Thanks yeah. for that. Anytime. It's always a great time to be with you. <laughs> it's been really fun. And I've, I, I, I'm like, even, like I said, I'm even more impressed with what's going on, um, how Fundraising Academy navigates these discussions and how they pull their talent in. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to for us to be a part of. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. We've had um, Muhi Kawaja with us who's like IRL in yeah. her, like he's her. it's not a hologram, yeah, not the hologram. I love it. I think it's really fun. You guys were glitching yesterday with some hologram. <laughs> yeah. In the back. Yeah. That's right. That's what that was. Oh my gosh. And of course, LaShonda Williams, um, who is, who joins us as well. Um, the two of you have been amazing and we have been thrilled to have you part be a part of our team and our discussions. Again, just to remind everybody, we've been live at the Cultivate Conference sponsored by Fundraising Academy at National University, a very successful event. Uh, We'll be letting you know when the next one's coming about because I know that already they're working on it. And so um, something I think you're gonna want to put on your calendar because it's really been successful. Again, we have amazing presenting presenting sponsors who join us on this journey, and they include our friends at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that allow us to travel to uh, San Diego and be a part of this journey. Hey, Jarrett, you're on a plane in a couple of hours, I'm assuming. I think so. (laughs) These days, I can't remember if I'm going, if I'm coming, where I'm going, where I'm coming from. So it's a little bit of a toss up. But I do think that I will be in an airport somewhere within the next couple of hours. (laughs) All right. Well, we will see you again on the flip side. As we like to end every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our trusted fundraisers that joined us today and our intrepid co-host Jared R. Ransom to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Rest up. Thank you. Thank you.